Its courageous pilots became, perhaps, the world's first jet aces. In Great Britain, Frank Whittle's jet research paralleled Heinkel's, and in 1941, his Gloucester Whittle prototype took to the air. Then, at government request, various companies worked feverishly to catch up with Germany. Gloucester's eventually produced the Meteor, while de Havilland's not only developed their own airframes, but also their own jet engines. Indeed, as early as 1943, they found themselves in the ironic position of supplying engines for this rival Meteor fighter. The de Havilland company built one of the earliest jet engines during the war, and uh, it was called the Goblin. And uh, in parallel with Sir Frank Whittle's development of his engine, uh, the Havillands brought the Goblin to a practical stage where it first was used in the vampire fighter. Though it was early 1943 before construction on the vampire began in earnest, by August the fighter was airborne. But it was not to be a jet aircraft's war, and the vampire saw as little war service as its well-known meteor counterpart. In May 1945, peace was declared, and the world rejoiced. It was a common holiday, and one wished to hope that war would never happen again. Yet, sadly, the atomic blast over Japan proved not to be the last page of the Second World War, but merely the first page of a new Cold War, with men seeking to go higher, further and faster. Seen from the quarterdeck of HMS Ocean, the vampire approaches for the first jet landing ever to be made on a ship at sea in December 1945. Flagged off by the deck control officer, the vampire gathers speed with deceptive slowness because the ship is itself travelling at over 30 miles an hour. To number 54 squadron RAF fell the honour of making the first jet crossing of the Atlantic. Taking off in two flights from Odium in July 1948, the route lay by way of Stornoway, Iceland, Greenland and Labrador. And this was the prelude to a tour of Canada and the United States and a return flight across the ocean. But other more fearsome frontiers of aviation were being crossed. The giant ghost engine was grafted into a special vampire to give it massive power, and an admiring world watched as John Cunningham coaxed the machine to well over 11 miles above the Earth's surface. No one had ever gone so high. It was a new world record. The height of the UB to so far is 59,446 feet. Uh, at that height, the outside air temperature is something colder than that found at the North Pole and the pressure of the air is a quarter that found on the ground. Undercarriage half frozen by the extreme cold, Cunningham could hardly land the vampire. After this, for the ghost engine, powering an airliner at a mere seven miles high would be easy. Also, at the end of the war, the Havilands uh, built a high-speed research, tailless research aircraft, which played a part in some of the flight development work that preceded the uh, flight of the comet. We developed uh, some of the power controls that flew in the comet. They were first flown in the third 108 that was built and used for research purposes. In the matter of speed, we've been investigating the behavior of aircraft fitted with uh, a gas turbine engine up to the speed of sound. We've brought back as much information as possible, partly from pilots' own report and also from an automatic recorder which contains a cine camera taking photographs of instruments in the aircraft. By the end of the decade, so reliable had de Havilland's centrifugal turbojets jets become that the Goblin was approved for a 600-hour overhaul period, while its big brother, the Ghost, became the first jet engine to be trusted to passenger airline duty. All the world's airliners were driven by propellers until the comet came along. 
And in 1946, the Brabazon Committee proposed that the country should build a transatlantic mail carrier flying at four to 500 miles an hour. And uh, the Havilands put their proposals forward, which were for a four-engined, four-ghost-engined airliner, which was the comet. Designers and aerodynamicists found that they could make a suitable 36 or thereabout seater uh, passenger aircraft that would fly at 500 miles an hour and could cross the Atlantic. So, accepting the responsibility of producing an airliner as revolutionary then as the Concorde was to be decades later, the de Havilland Company had completed one of the most stringent testing programs ever associated with a passenger airliner. The basic shape was proved to be a sound design with wooden models, both scale and full size. A complete nose section was mounted on a wartime glider for visibility and windshield tests. A complete mock-up of the flight deck was used to determine ease of access to controls for pilots and navigators. Undercarriage tests on special rigs were made to determine safe and accurate handling on the ground, and a ghost engine was even rigged behind a mock-up flight deck to evaluate noise levels. The first flight of the Comet took place in July 1949, and it was a great moment to us, Hatfield, because the Comet combined in it various items, all of which we had flown in, perhaps in different aeroplanes, before that, so there was nothing uh, basically uh, unknown to those of us who were about to fly it. I did three short hops in the morning each hop just far enough into the air along the runway to satisfy myself that the elevators worked reasonably on one hop, the second hop that the ailerons worked, and the third one that the rudder was effective. And in each hop, I landed on the runway and stopped. At the end of that day, when our inspectors had satisfied themselves all was well with the aircraft, I took the aircraft up to 10,000 feet and uh, was very satisfied with the handling and behavior of the aircraft. So it was that the skies of an English summer first echoed to a new sound. On the 27th of July, John Cunningham's 32nd birthday, over the Hertfordshire countryside, the age of the passenger jet was born. people from the workforce at Havilands at Hatfield who had watched the flight were able to enjoy it. The principal team behind the Comet included men like Sir Geoffrey de Havilland himself, C.C. Walker, the technical director, men like Spittle, Kerr Wilson, Clark, Brodie, Arscott, and the man behind the development of the ghost engine, Frank Halford. R.E. Bishop, who started as an apprentice with de Havilland and became a director as well as its chief designer. And it was the personal courage of men like John Derry and John Cunningham that led the world into a new era. It was the culmination of a successful decade for de Havilland, and although the air rang with the sound of fighter aircraft, it was the comet that the crowds flocked to see at the 1949 Farnborough Air Show. 
C.C. Walker, Sir Geoffrey's chief engineer, sums up the promise of a new travel era. It is evident now that the jet airliner, with speeds around 500 miles an hour, can be made to pay, and that such speeds are not just an expensive luxury. The jet engine burns a lot of fuel, but much less when it is operating at great heights. And the larger number of journeys, the more work which the fast aircraft can do in the year reduces the cost of transport. In this new form of air travel, Britain has the chance to make up the leeway lost in the war. When we were developing combat aircraft to the exclusion of all else. The normal speed that propeller-driven airliners flew at was about 250 miles an hour. The Comet, with its jet engines, flew at about 450 miles an hour, and at one stroke, almost doubled the speed of an airliner. And I think the rest of the world looked with some surprise uh, at the Comet's performance, and in America in particular, where they had not had very happy experiences with their jet engines in military aircraft, were rather surprised that the Havilands had produced a jet engine driven airliner to carry passengers. Surprised indeed, for as the Comet began its extensive trials program, the United States, as with this Boeing XB-47, had literally to power their jets into the air with rocket-assisted engines. Reverse thrust having yet to be perfected and landing at high speeds, the heavy machine had to rely on the stopping power of a parachute. Such were the expectations of the Comet that even before the prototype had flown, production work had already begun on 16 others, 14 of which were for BOAC. These expectations began to be realized when, in October 1949, John Cunningham flew the comet from London to Tripoli and back in a single day. Six months later, the comet was to set up a new point-to-point -point record between London and Cairo. With its airworthiness certificate obtained in 1952, its future was set, and on May the 2nd of that year, the world saw the first scheduled jet airliner service operating between London and Johannesburg in a little over 23 hours. The Comet 1 had reached BOAC a full six months ahead of schedule, and with interest spreading, UAT of France became the first overseas operator with the slightly higher capacity 44-seater Comet 1A. But suddenly, on May the 2nd, 1953, there came disaster. It was exactly a year after the inaugural fight. The Comet 1 had one year uh, entirely satisfactory service, and on the anniversary of its start of service with BOAC, uh, a comet taking off from Calcutta flew into a violent thunderstorm and failed structurally. It was the worst disaster in the 13-year history of BOAC. Subsequent investigations determined and eyewitnesses' accounts confirmed that this tragic incident was, in the words of one report, an act of God. The Comet 1 had been the victim of a violent thunderstorm. Rolls-Royce were meanwhile developing the Avon engine, which was uh, somewhat more powerful than the Ghost and rather more fuel efficient. De Havilland's introduced on August the 27th, 1953, the new Comet 2, and world interest was justifiably sustained. But then... Jampino, this is George Jampino, passing flight level 260 for cruising altitude 360. All right, J.O. Peter, passing flight level 260. 
George Oak Peter from George Hardwick, understanding passing 260. What's the cloud cover? George Hardwick from uh, George Oak Peter. Did you get my last? That was the last heard from BOAC Comet 1 Yoke Peter, shortly after it took off from Rome's Ciampino Airport. Less than a minute after Captain Alan Gibson's unfinished message to another BOAC aircraft, two fishermen off the coast of Elba witnessed the first blow that was to shake the very foundations of world civil aviation. I heard three explosions, one fisherman said. Then, several miles away, I saw a silver thing flash out of the clouds. By the time I got there, all was still. Yoke Peter was lost with all on board. In Great Britain, BOAC and the nation in general were shocked by the news. Ironically, it had been Yoke Peter that was used by BOAC for the inaugural flight of Comet services. But as the bodies of 15 victims were brought to the Isle of Elba by local fishermen, BOAC had no choice but to ground all its comets. Witnesses were fine, but if there was to be more than mere speculation to go on, Yoke Peter would have to be brought to the surface. The Royal Navy vessel Sea Salva, with the most up-to-date salvage equipment on board, began an immediate search of the area. Back in Great Britain, the grounded comets had been thoroughly inspected and some 50 modifications suggested. Reinforced shields were placed between the engines and fuel tanks, the fuel lines reinforced, and safeguards against the buildup of hydrogen were improved, and extra fire and smoke detectors fitted. But still there remained only speculation as to the fate of Yoke Peter. Even as the comets were being modified, the Royal Navy, using sonar and underwater television cameras, began to locate pieces of Yoke Peter's twisted carcass. By the end of February, they had retrieved a large section of the comet's tail, several seats, and two sections of fuselage from well over 400 feet of water. On March the 31st, the grappling hooks locked onto the entire forward section of the cockpit. The flight engineer was still strapped in his seat. And strangely, the cabin roof was missing. The pieces, which by now included engines, undercarriage, wing spars and fuselage skin, were flown back to Great Britain and began to be assembled on the floor of a hangar at the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. But on March the 23rd, comets modified, BOAC resumed services. Every seat was taken. Confidence was restored in the comet. The painstaking task of detailed reconstruction continued, and Yoke Peter began to take on an eerie shape. Just two weeks later, disaster struck again. Yoke, Yoke. A Comet 1 crashed minutes after takeoff from Rome. This time it was night. There were no witnesses and no clues. The airworthiness certificate was withdrawn, and at parliamentary insistence, the investigation took on a new urgency. And although development was allowed to continue on the Comet 3, all work on the 2 was suspended indefinitely. There were three main lines of investigation. The wreckage, the detailed flight testing of another comet, and the pressure testing of yet another. The comet was made from over one million separate parts, any one of which might contain a vital clue. The Royal Navy had salvaged virtually 70% of Yoke Peter, but would it be enough? 
BOAC's impressed Comet 1, Yoke Uncle, was stripped of its furnishings, engines and equipment and delivered by road to Farnborough, where it was to be reassembled. It had flown about 3,500 hours, the same as the Elba Comet. It was decided to construct a new type of test rig. A site was cleared and work started on a water testing tank of huge capacity. The idea was to fill the tank and aircraft with water simultaneously and then increase the water pressure in the cabin to simulate the differential that occurs in normal flight. This tank, pressurized with air to the point of destruction, shows vividly what could have happened if cabin air pressure failed. The reassembled yoke uncle was wheeled to the partially completed tank. Since it was intended to simulate wing loading and wind gusting, it was necessary for the wings to protrude through the side of the tank to enable a certain amount of flexing. Lead ballast was added to yoke uncle to simulate passenger load, and final preparations were made for filling the tank. Once filled, the tests began that were to simulate 11 hours of pressurized flight every 21 minutes. Hydraulically operated mechanisms supplied the right amount of stress and load, which had been carefully calculated by analyzing the records of 2,000 flying hours of comets on BOAC routes. As the tank tests continued, the wreckage from the Mediterranean was examined minutely. Little by little, as the twisted parts were pieced together, some curious things were found. The impression of a one-anna piece, probably from a passenger's pocket, was testimony to Yoke Peter's violent last moments. To support the investigations on the ground, an operational comet, Abel Victor, was subjected to an extensive series of flight tests. The passenger cabin was stripped of fittings and recording instruments and strain gauges were applied throughout the aircraft. The pilots, all RAF officers of the experimental flying department, were accompanied by civilian scientific staff from Farnborough and flying personnel from de Havilland's. The stringent tests required the aircraft to fly unpressurized. Structural vibrations were recorded and measurements concerning the flying characteristics of the aircraft were made together with engine temperature measurement and even cabin heating efficiency. Constantly, information from the ground tests was incorporated into the flight programs and vice versa. These flight tests, all 70 of them, monitored activity at 60 different points in the aircraft and over the period, Abel Victor flew a distance equivalent to that twice round the world. Suddenly, when the equivalent to a full life of Yoke Uncle was about four and a half times that of the Elba Comet, a major breakthrough occurred. A crack developed rapidly by a port side window and suddenly the cabin was ripped open for a length of over 15 feet. This major failure confirmed that the structure of the escape hatches and windows was vulnerable and metal fatigue was proved in subsequent laboratory tests to have been the cause. The examination of the elbow wreckage, proceeding simultaneously, confirmed that the failure started at a direction-finding aerial window in the roof of the cabin. The failure began in the rear one of two ADF windows and spread rapidly forward. On the other side of the window, the crack ran aft. The internal pressure forced the two halves upwards and, breaking away, they were projected violently along the wings. Paint traces and deep scratches in the salvaged wing confirmed the pattern of events. Then a portion of the fuselage structure was blown backwards by the airstream and struck the tailplane. The breakup of the aircraft followed rapidly. The rear fuselage came away folding downwards about the rear spar and then fell into the sea with the open end downwards. The aircraft, now nose heavy, dived towards the sea with its wings folding downwards. About the same time, the nose separated and the center section, complete with engines, turned over and descended in a spin landing upside down in the water. Great Britain's wonder plane was finished. As a result of the grounding of the comets and the withdrawal of the certificate of airworthiness, we lost the enormous lead 
that we had in world aviation. And it was four years before we got back into uh, commercial jet business with the Comet 4. And as is very often the case with pioneers, uh, the pioneer learns the hard way and your competitors will learn from your own misfortunes. In fact, on the 15th of July, 1954, just four days before the prototype Comet 3 took to the air, the rival Boeing company launched what was to become the most popular jet airliner to date, the 707. The Haviland Comet. No civil airliner has undergone a more intensive testing program. This version is the 3B. Notice the effect of reverse thrust from the four Rolls-Royce Avon jets as the huge airliner touches down. Now, the Comet 4. By 1954, the Havilands, fighting a rear guard action, began its Comet sales drive and the world's buyers flocked to Farnborough. It was still one of the most advanced aircraft. Soon after the Farnborough show, a Comet 4 completed the trip from Hong Kong to London in just over 16 hours, a record for the distance. And so the eyes of the world were to focus once more upon the Comet. A year later, in December 1955, John Cunningham took the only Comet 3 produced on a world tour. Not only did the new Comet break existing records, it established many new ones. It was the first jet passenger aircraft to fly to Australia, the first to cross the Pacific and Atlantic, the first to travel around the world, and all in a little over a total of 53 flying hours. But although global interest was shown, it proved to be impossible to totally disestablish itself from its past, and sales never did meet expectations. Meanwhile, the Royal Air Force, who had taken over the BOAC order for Comet 2s when the aircraft were grounded, were already stripping the airframes and strengthening them. Various modifications were made, and in June 1956, they entered service with Transport Command. It was soon apparent that the Comet 4's virtues, currently being enjoyed in the civil aviation world, were also ideally suited to a military support role. In times of tension, the military Comet 4's high speed and great carrying capacity enabled it to offer rapid support to other supply aircraft operating from distant strategic bases. Its efficiency enabled troops to be quickly deployed to the battle zone, its carrying capacity ensured adequate supplies of food, munitions and spares, and its speed enabled rapid repatriation for the injured in battle. For over a decade, the RAF and 14 foreign airlines, as well as BEA and BOAC, enjoyed and were well satisfied with the profitability and efficiency of the Comet 4 series. In all its variants, it had been a pioneer, a pace setter, a milestone in world aviation, 
In its genesis, the comet had shown all others the way. The disasters, horrendous even by today's standards, paved the way, painfully, to a safer future for the air travelers of the world. But the airline's regular need to modernize their fleets eventually caught up with the comet. And in February 1964, with sights set on new production horizons, comet production ceased. It was no surprise that in the mid-60s, after careful consideration, the proven Comet airframe was chosen as the basis of an aircraft intended to replace a contemporary of the early Comet, the aging Lancaster-derived Shackleton. For the Comet itself, it was to be a new beginning. Renamed Nimrod, the Mark I prototype was fitted with the original Avon engines from the Comet 4C. Rolls-Royce Spey jet engines were subsequently installed. The Nimrod 1 was almost identical to the Comet 4C, but fitted with extra fuel tanks, more electronics, and sensitive submarine detection equipment. The first of 43 Nimrod Mark 1s flew from the British Aerospace Factory at Woodford on the 28th of June, 1968, and immediately began to replace the Shackleton in the maritime role. With the increasing Soviet activity around Great Britain's shores, it became apparent that the sophisticated avionics equipment necessary to detect and monitor Soviet movements had to be updated. And of the original 43 Nimrod Mark I's produced, 32 were returned to the British Aerospace Manchester Works and completely gutted in order to house the new equipment. And the first conversion was re-delivered to the RAF in August 1979. The performance was unchanged, but its effectiveness over the seas was enhanced beyond measure. In the book of Genesis, Cush begat Nimrod, and he became a mighty hunter. In its Genesis, the comet begat Nimrod, and like its biblical namesake, proved itself to be a mighty hunter. Captain Radar, high confidence, snort, bearing 260, file number 4. Seek us, honey. Okay, for action stations, prepare for that. Captain Radar, CDS, hurry, file 204. It's looking good, Nelson. Watch him. Assistant, clear to see what you're doing. The DIP cams are 17, power 38, and low far 50. Up until 1945, most of the U-boats sunk by aircraft had first been located on the surface, forced there by the need to recharge batteries. To catch one on the surface today is a rare occasion. Able to scan vast areas of ocean and identify targets with the aid of its own digital computer tied into the aircraft's totally new central tactical system, the Nimrod's ability to protect Great Britain's interests is staggering. Even under the waves, the enemy has no place to hide. The prying Nimrod electronics ensure that he remains the hunted, not the hunter. Encircled by sonar boys, each sending back data to the onboard central processor, every tactic the submarine might employ is detected. Oh, no, the circle clear. 
Sensitive detectors spot minute anomalies in the Earth's magnetic field caused by the presence of the submarine. There is no escape. Shutting down two of the Spey engines enables extremely long patrol lengths, for it's not just vessels beneath the waves that Nimrod monitors. The Soviet presence around Great Britain's shores often gives rise for concern, and the protection of friendly vessels, oil rig installations, and our own lifelines are watched over by Nimrod's keen electronic eyes. Potentially hostile shipping is constantly monitored, as well as extensively photographed. Electronic support measures housed in the tail of some Nimrods and in the wingtips of others provide essential information concerning hostile radar emissions. For Nimrod can protect itself too, should it sense itself to be under attack. Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles form part of its self-defense system along with its lethal Stingray torpedoes. During times of war, Nimrod was called upon to protect the waters of threatened islands far from the British Isles. Flight duration was increased by the addition of in-flight refueling probes. And with its greatly extended range, Nimrod was a welcome addition to the forces in the South Atlantic patrolling the Falklands exclusion zone. To the casual observer, the delicate handling of the Nimrod and the flying skills necessary to complete the maneuver are breathtaking. In contact, green on. Although developed from an original disaster, this incredibly reliable hunter shows no sign of fatigue. And it was in the early 80s that with its past finally washed away, the British government decided on yet another extension to its life. This time as an advanced technology early warning radar platform. The initial trials proved a success and on July the 16th, 1980, the AEW-3 prototype, with its strange front and rear facing radomes, flew for the first time. Since the late 60s, the role of airborne early warning has been the responsibility of yet another variant of a comet contemporary, the Shackleton.
But again, sadly, for this comet descendant, yet more problems were on the horizon. Although supposedly equipped with the most advanced of radar systems, in the final analysis, the AEW Nimrod was no more than an expensive white elephant. Unable to determine targets accurately, and in most respects no more advanced than the existing Shackletons, the Nimrod was totally incompatible with other NATO equipment. And as the project became increasingly more politically embarrassing for the British government, a financial disaster was looming. After spending over $1.4 billion on the project, the British government withdrew its support, and this new Nimrod variant ceased to exist. The government opted instead for the American E-3A Sentry, or AWACS, the aircraft originally offered to Great Britain almost a decade before. One would have thought that this final blow would have heralded the end of the Nimrod which had seemed to almost hang on through thick and thin right from the early days of its predecessor, the Comet. But not so. Throughout the 80s and 90s, the Maritime Nimrod has continued to give sterling service, but nonetheless a replacement was sought, and the Royal Air Force considered initially the Dassa Atlantique III and two versions of the Lockheed Martin P3 Orion. In addition, British Aerospace made a proposal to upgrade the Nimrod. Once again, the Nimrod survived its threatened replacement, and on the 25th of July, 1996, the British government announced it was to adopt the British solution, and under the commercial designation Nimrod 2000, this comet derivative was given yet another lease of life. Virtually 80% of the airframe will be reconstructed and four new marinized, non-afterburning BMW Rolls-Royce turbofan engines fitted, the Nimrod 2000 will, no doubt, continue to bear resemblance to its famous, or infamous, forebear. Optimized for anti-submarine warfare, search and rescue, maritime reconnaissance, and for operations against terrorism, drug smuggling, and blockade running, 21 of the new Nimrods will start to be delivered to the RAF in 2002 with completion four years later. These, along with 49 original Nimrods built and only 112 comets, may seem an insignificant number of aircraft. But numbers aren't necessarily important when it's remembered that without the pioneering efforts of de Havilland and the incredible work of the Royal Aircraft Establishment, aviation in general would not have reached the high standard of safety that the world takes for granted. To be reborn so many times, phoenix-like, from the awful experiences of over 40 years ago, can only be a tribute to those that strove to get it right. <laughs> <laughs>